are in fact recording. So uh, previously, I wanted to make the claim that uh, decorators, including all the class elements, including private names, uh, was not problematic for security and modularity. And in fact, it has similar uh, aspects to it, to even if we don't include them at all. Um, and this is, comes down to really two points that I want to bring up when we're talking about decorating a class. Um, one is, uh, one of the driving features of decorators is the ability to entirely replace the class. Meaning you could replace a class, which is only able to be constructed with new, with a function, which you could call or apply to and get something else. So the common term for that is a callable constructor. Um, that is one of the driving use cases of classes. There are a few other ones for why you may want to replace the class entirely. Um, mix-ins abstract superclasses, that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, so that's one of my claims, is we will be able to replace classes entirely if we decorate them. Okay. Two, the ability to reevaluate a class's source code has similar uh, aspects to it as if a decorator were able to um, intercept the private names of the class it's decorating, is my second claim. Oh, 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 the the ability to reevaluate the source code. I had not considered that one. That's very interesting. So, a good example of this is if we had a private field ID and we did some sort of operation with a private field inside of our class, expecting it to be encapsulated by our class. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I, I understand the form of argument. I, I, I have often argued from uh, if you rewrote it, you could accomplish X. Therefore, there's no loss of security in enabling that entity that could have re done the rewriting to do X anyway. Uh, this so, is one of those. So um, that's my claim, but I want to make a further claim if we can skip ahead due to time constraints. Okay. If we do have a need for a different structure of private, uh, private state. Um, where just like if we use an evaluator, we can reevaluate the class's source text, we can't access its closure. So if it is referencing an external binding, that's we right. can't reevaluate it and maintain that, uh, that binding. Yes, that's correct. So I've added an agenda item, which is very relevant, at least to this discussion, about private declarations and the ability to produce a private binding not within the class source text itself but outside of it okay so that it would be only able to be gotten to via this closure mechanism so in terms of the um the uh the private state at um weak map ish Model, in terms of the weak mapish model of private state, where the pr private name object is is such a collection, uh, does this declaration turn into approximately a const declaration of the same name uh, initialized to the private name map? Uh, for the proposed form, I would say yes, but we're not going to be exposing the private name in the same way as a first class value, at least with what I'm proposing. Okay. Now. If, um, okay. Okay. So that's if you have a private name outside the class. Uh, right now, we're not decorating anything that's outside a class. Um, so, so the private name dec uh, declaration that you're proposing is not decoratable. Correct. And I never want it to be decoratable, actually. Okay. I um, can share slides there. Yeah, please. Uh, 
This might help enlighten things. Yeah. Uh, can we see this? I'm assuming so. Yeah, and it's being recorded. Sure, that's fine. Um, we're going to present this uh, next week, but it comes from two, or well, three now, driving questions of, do we want to be able to pass uh, the keys, the ways to access our private data round as a first-class value, which decorators, by their very nature, need to have it as a first-class value. So the question is, what can we do for cases where it doesn't need decoration? Um, the second thing is, should we have the exact appearance of accessing public data? Things like private symbols do uh, look as if they are public access. Uh, private fields do not look like they're pro uh, public access. And sorry, lastly, what, um, sorry, what is, can we what, what, Sorry, just what does looking like public access mean? Uh, so when you access a field, this dot foo, it is accessing the public uh, property dot foo. Okay. When you use a computed property, it is this uh, open bracket foo close bracket for whatever foo is. If it's a symbol, if it's a string, it doesn't really matter. It's available under public reflection. Okay. But when you access things through private fields, it's always through dot hash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so um, roughly what we have today is kind of this. Uh, we have class foo, bar, yep. you know. Yep. This does not look like public access is roughly what I'm getting to. Okay. Uh, this private state roughly uh, equates to a weak map. Um, internal VM implementation differs, but yeah. For, ha have you yeah. seen? Have you seen my uh, private name class that wraps a weak map that has a distinct init versus a sign? So we're going to get to that in a minute. Okay. Uh, we're going to go very fast of this because we're running short on time. But okay. uh, there are some problems with doing this with weak maps, yep. um, mutating state. Yep. So the idea here is what if we introduced a declaration private bar and we allowed people to start accessing bar on other value, other bindings within the scope and the values contained within. And so... If we have this private bar, which is a way of declaring a private uh, field, not within a class, but within a scope, um, we can kind of start to do some interesting things. We can use this within an object literal as long as uh, bar remains in scope. I'm sorry. You have, uh, a get, you have a getter named bar as well. That, na that name coincidence is intentional? This is intentional, just... It's, it's setting up people when they ask me questions about it. Okay. Um, I hope I don't get asked questions about it, but I might. Um, so we could assign to bar and all this. But there's a problem here where we don't want to add a private, private field to something unintentionally. Yeah. And uh, assignment is generally going to be unintentional. Right. We also don't want to reinitialize. This is... Right. Perhaps even more important, we don't want to reinitialize a private field. Yep. And so classes are proposing something called class.initialize for this problem for some web compatibility reasons. And so piggybacking off the same idea, this is subject to bike shedding. We could introduce a way to initialize a private field on an arbitrary value, similar to how a weak map can take an arbitrary object and put uh, it within itself and map a value on it. Okay. Does that make sense so far? Say, so, it, say, say it again. I think I got it. So similar to how a weak map can take an object and attach a value mapping to it, I want to be able to use uh, these private fields or private declarations, sorry, uh, in such a way that I could attach them to a object in the same manner where it's not at instantiation time. It's not when the object is allocated, but potentially later. Okay. But, ju but just by having a registration operation here called initialize, that is 
in, intentional and um, uh, for, for the purpose of registering specifically something that has not already been registered. Correct. And this is actually possible with the private fields through some really yeah, odd uh, scenario setups. And it's in the private fields FAQ on how to make private fields work with proxies. Okay. Um, uh, I know I, it's the return override trick, right? Yes. Okay. And classes, like I said, for uh, reasons of uh, inheritance hierarchy of the web are going to probably introduce and propose next week class.initialize. Okay. So similar here, we're separating out the initialization thing. Do it multiple times, you get errors. Okay. Don't do it, you can't access it. Good. So one of the questions that gets brought up whenever we bring this up is shadowing. We already have computer properties within classes use uh, the external scope for fields. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, same, same idea here. If you have a bar private uh, field for the class foo, you know, it's not computed. It accesses it within itself. If you have a bar field that's from the outer scope, you could use the same syntax and it it maps the same so, for what scope is being pulled in. Okay. So um, uh, the when you use a square bracket bar uh, as as you've highlighted, um, does that that creates the, uh, the the when the object literal evaluates to an object that does an initialize, not an assign, of this object to the bar map. Oh, uh, this isn't supposed to be an object literal. It's supposed to be a class. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. I, I am currently not proposing inline object literal syntax for this. I see. I could, but yeah, maybe later. Okay, so now with it being a class, I no longer know what you intended to mean. Okay, so so class foo will have a public field outside equal to some value because it pulls bar from its external scope. Right, right, and 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 right. And so in the same okay. manner. Got it. Okay. I actually okay. didn't know that the computer, that makes sense now, because the computed properties have to be computed ahead. Of. Okay. Yep. Okay, very good. Um, we could propose this, this highlighted. Uh, I, I'm somewhat up in the air. Using it with the computed, um, the computed literal syntax seems fine to me, but I am hesitant to actually remove those computed square brackets around it. Okay, so so let me um, so so with this code, I can ask the question that I was uh, thinking about uh, with the previous code, uh, which is the way this would evaluate uh, is that the object literal would evaluate to an object, and then the uh, pound bar private state map object would be invoked. Uh, its initialize method would be invoked to register the instance with bar. Yes. Okay, good. And store the value zero as its initialization value. Good. And then this, since uh, bars within scope, it acts just like it does within classes and gets the external scope. Right. Because you can have nested scopes within classes. Um, so yeah. And this just starts going over more examples. Okay. So while I have you on recorded chat here, um, I'm going to find my uh, private name thing. Um, but I, I do think this is absolutely necessary considering our uh, decoration problem where storing private state within the class itself is perpetually subject to evaluators. Okay. Um, if we want to create a private uh, storage mechanism 
uh, it needs to be done via a closure. This is currently possible with some interesting nesting of classes, um, but this just makes it actually readable. Okay, so I am now trying to screen share. Do people see my screen? And I just switched yeah. my screen to uh, private name.js inside um, a repository of mine. Um, sorry, I had a quick question on the code that Bradley showed. Uh, before we move on, we don't have to switch back screens or anything. Just a really quick question. Um, are you thinking of lock scoping private? So could I create like like let and const basically? Can I have a, a nested block scope with its own private and anything outside that block scope cannot affect the private uh, bindings that occur within that block scope? Correct. This also gets into something we saw in the last meeting where rollup is trying to eliminate scopes. And we don't want that. So yeah. we do want block scopes to be available, not hoisted. I, I love that uh, concept, honestly. Like, I'm really falling in love with it. So. Okay. Perfect. So uh, switching to uh, my screen, um, uh, I've got, let's just, for, let's just take a look at uh, lines uh, 3 through 22. I'll expand it. Um, this is an adequate expression of, uh, the semantics I have in mind. Um, so this make boot private name um, makes an object like a weak map, and it does it by wrapping a weak map. Uh, and uh, the weak map has these four methods. I'm sorry, three methods. Uh, um, I'm sorry, weak map has four methods, which is has, get, set, and delete. I'm not making use of any delete here. And I'm adding an init that's, I think, the same as the init Bradley was just talking about, um, um, and not and purposely omitting delete. Um, so first of all, I just want to check with Bradley that this is um, uh, precisely mirroring the semantics he has in mind. Um, uh, so init, if the underlying weak map already has the key, we throw. And otherwise, we set it on the weak, on the underlying weak map. Uh, get um, if it's not there, rather than returning undefined, we throw, uh, and otherwise we do a get. Um, uh, and if and for a set, uh, if it's not there, then we throw and otherwise do a set. Yes, this matches me, but it makes me need to go and reread the private fields to ensure their init does throw on double init. Okay, good. But but this th this is the semantics you would like. Correct. Good, good. Uh, and then the b the bottom of this file, what I'm doing here is I'm just um, you know, the thing up here uh, at the top of the file is doing it as an object literal where the four methods are own properties which is not the JavaScript style for, uh, it's not, well, first of all, it's not weak map like in the sense that weak map is following the class pattern, not the objects as closure pattern. So I used the make boot private. It turned out that was the right first thing to do to say such that I can then do a private name um, uh, in terms of that. Um, and I'm doing it this way because I, I'm writing this code not using primitive private names because I'm using this to explain the semantics of the private name that we would introduce. So I'm trying to do it only with existing abstractions. And then I, using that, I go through, um, yeah, so uh, so using it, the current private name proposal, I can model it in terms of the private name object. If we imagine that uh, ampersand pound state just represents some mangling of, um, of the, the pound state variable into a lexical name that is not otherwise mentioned, you know, standard trick of, of explaining something by expansion is there is an assumed magical non 
uh, conflict in the expansion, uh, fresh names. Um, uh, so I would claim that uh, uh, the class at the top with the private state variable, uh, the semantics of it is exactly reflected by um, the, uh, the more explicit code at the bottom of the current screen. And then, okay, now over here, um, we get to, um, uh, uh, at the top of the screen now, is um, uh, something that I think corresponds to an explanatory expansion of the private, the external explicit private syntax that Bradley was just referring to. Um, I, I don't understand the ampersand hash access at the bottom. You know, I think I think I'm looking at the wrong thing. Hold on. So one of my things is actually I am explicitly trying to avoid reifying into a first class value and only having it within references. So if so when I do it with a weak map, right? When I, I right now I can do private state with weak map, and and if I'm careful about initialize versus assignment, I can get all of the semantics of of any of these private state, you know, of of, of both the, the the mainline private state proposal and of your explicit private state. But the weak map way of expressing it also lets me reify the weak map. So why is that not a feature? So for what purposes do you want to use it to reify that? Ah, so, um, uh, so the following does not answer your question, but just now that I'm looking at the, the looking more carefully at the code that I wrote. Uh, so there's the gimme special access method at the bottom, uh, where I'm now uh, uh, not treating uh, ampersand pound anymore as um, a um, as an assumed mangle, but rather as explicit syntax um, uh, for reifying. Um, and so that would that would give you the private name object itself, which is reifying, but does not. But that does, of course, does not answer your question. Um, so, it okay. Uh, it would let me set up what a C plus plus programmer might call friend relationships. And in particular, it would let me set up a situation where I could have open box test code elsewhere, where I arrange for it and only it to be able to reach in and access the private state of these objects. So I do think this is important. So I'm going to share my screen again, because I actually have more slides. OK. Uh, sharing is caring. Um, so there are, there are ways to set up uh, shared secrets already with some finagling of cycles in ESM. Um, there's a whole lot of trust going on when you do it. Um, uh, when you put uh, actual getters and setters, this is what languages which don't have friend access do. Um, they expose getters and setters, uh, either by decorators, annotations, or the like. Uh, for test builds, things like that. Um, I'm actually fairly uninterested in that because uh, getting people to run things in the right environment uh, has proven to be interesting for Node. <laughs> um, so the real question is, how do we limit who can get access to things? Right. So if we had uh, exports that only applied to other module records, 
um, this would be less problematic, saying that, oh, only my test files can access this. Um, and not actually prefetching those files or anything, but going through there. Uh, in, this, in a similar way, we already have kind of this interesting uh, aliasing mechanism for imports, and we can do these export statements separate from declarations. Um, I'm sorry. How, how did you limit who can who who can get at the who can share by this mechanism? I didn't understand. So this is not from. This is for. Oh oh oh. Okay, got it. It could be export with or uh, uh, friendly export. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, I had not considered that. That's interesting. Okay. Um, I really. I really do worry about uh, exposing this as a first class value because you get into weird interception uh, mechanisms where people start doing prototype based mutation in order to get a hold of something that is privileged. Um, I mean, in general, the, the premise of object capability programming is uh, permissions are represented as reified objects and you grant a permission by passing access to the object. Uh, I would agree with that statement. Um, I am just looking in a different direction currently, but I agree that this use case does need to be solved. Okay. Um, uh, so this, so, so by just providing reification directly, you're kind of reducing it to, um, within a module, a previously solved problem, and then between modules, when you're trying to uh, restrict who can who can import it, uh, let's say we're reducing it to a previously unsolved problem, um, uh, uh, but it's a problem that we need to address in general, not just for this mechanism. And and four is interesting. I've never considered that. Do you know Mike Samuel's module keys proposal? Yes, I do. Okay. So. Um... This is similar, but done as a syntax. Yeah, instead. yeah, it's interesting. Um, for object capabilities, I think this is, is a little bit weird, uh, but it avoids at least some naive uh, leakage. Yeah. It's still leaking it in various ways if you expose getters and setters. Uh, so I don't so understand the I don't understand the point about getters and setters. So in C sharp, uh, well. C sharp is where I've mostly seen this. Uh, in test builds, they'll expose private state as getters and setters. And so, if we had a private state where a uh, person dot social security number uh, was private normally, during the test build, dot social security number would not be private. Would not be private, or would be accessible to the test code specially. Uh, Yes, both. <laughs> okay, um, so so what we would like is to be able to arrange that it remains private, but also be able to make it accessible purely to the test code. Yes, and I don't have a solution for that. This is okay. just kind of... Okay, yeah. And with regard to the... the um, as long as we have impure modules, resource modules, going back to our normal topic of conversation, um, any initialized time limit, limited access between modules is always going to feel a little non-object capability because it's happening statically and declaratively. Um, uh, it's only by going all the way to what uh, Daria did uh, uh, with um, uh, all modules being pure and all state being instances uh, that you go back to a pure object capability story even for initial access to things. Uh, I would agree there. Um, so a minor good thing uh, talking about initialization uh, they do check that the private field doesn't already exist on values in class. Okay. Um, oh, but. I'm going to the the uh, pay, the thing I was looking at. I forgot to going to go back and paste the URL into the chat. I'm stop sharing. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, that was, you know, that, that was what I wanted to say for now about the, the my private name thing. Uh, Bradley, did you have anything else you wanted to, to say about it? No, I, I was just bringing this up with regards to uh, the problem that was seen with decorators, the concern about uh, how to enable this private state, uh, and we should look at a new feature to do it, because mm -hmm. I can't think of a way to solve the problem you brought up about decorators without introducing a way to put the uh, private binding in the closure. Okay. Um, yes. Yes, I think that's a very nice observation. It's not one that I, I, I hadn't been thinking about the re-evaluation as a way to analyze who should be allowed to do what. And I think it's very insightful. Um, uh, the class decorator, uh, there's no loss of security in enabling it to do anything it could do by reevaluation. And a private declaration outside the class text is clearly outside of its powers to capture with a reevaluation. So that's very nice. So that's it for this. I think, Alex, you want to talk to me briefly about something a week ago. We had an email. Do you have time for a second? I have time. My work day is over. Okay. We also have some more comments in chat. Um, I think we can stop recording at this point. Uh, it looks like the comments in chat are relevant to what we're just talking about, so I'm going to keep recording while we go through okay. those. So Sala, okay. Sala re refers to super.x. Yeah, this was covered already. Uh, like it was before Bradley mentioned that it's actually uh, locally scoped, like like let and const. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Got yeah, it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, love where this is heading. Once uh, scoping private. Okay, we clarify that. Uh, weak map, a set call has a return value of the weak map. Ditto for the map. Ah, ah, so that's a, a criticism of my private name abstraction at being unnecessarily divergent from the weak map API. Uh, that's correct. I should fix that. Okay. Um, I think that uh, at, at this point, we can go ahead and stop recording.